Hey, folks. Morning, morning. Great to see you all. Welcome to the first full day of the 2015 Green Sports Alliance Summit. My name is Alan Hershkowitz, and it says here that I am the co-founder and president of the Green Sports Alliance, and I think that's true. Um, um, before we move into today's program, I, I, I just want to, uh, I thought yesterday was just such a great day, and I, 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 I want to just make a couple of observations and offer some thanks. So last night's uh, athletes panel was, was, was just wonderful, so, so important. Um, you know, outside of the family, the most influential role models are athletes and entertainers. And as uh, Brendan Brazier reminded us that, you know, all of us work hard at our jobs. We all try to do the best that we can, but, you know, very few of us are in a position where we are competing to be the single best performer uh, in our field, in the world. Uh, and as Brendan reminded us, you know, that really creates a kind of uh, mental and physical bubble that, uh, you know, the A-list athletes, you know, live in. And for them to take the time to sort of figure out how to step out of that bubble and think about broader issues like environmental stewardship, you know, to have A-list athletes still in their prime on our panel talking about environmental stewardship is really a, a unique and, and, and wonderful privilege and uh, kudos to them for, for figuring out how to do that. I know that they're trying so hard to, to be the best in their field. Uh, and I also want to uh, congratulate UPS on yesterday's Thought Leadership uh, Forum. Uh, many of us were there. Uh, what a great event that was. What an important event. Um, for those of you who weren't there, UPS brought together a, a lot of uh, business leaders to um, figure out how to advance sustainability through the sports platform. Uh, there's nothing, uh, nothing like that being done. I mean, they're really helping to invent uh, a new platform to advance sustainability in the world of business. And yesterday's event was just really superb. I was, I was, I was honored to be part of it. And, uh, and also uh, a shout out and congratulations to our friends at the National Hockey League, uh, yesterday's NHL symposium which many of us were at, uh, to have Commissioner Bettman come here and uh, celebrate environmental stewardship, recommit the NHL to even more progress. Um, you know, again, talk about competing obligations. You know, the, a professional sports commissioner has a lot of competing obligations, and for him to take the time to fly out here, uh, and he came specifically for this event, you know, to express his commitment to environmental stewardship and moving the sports industry and the world towards um, more intelligent ecological practices, that, that was great. So thanks to our friends at the NHL, and I know that um, Major League Baseball and the NBA and NASCAR and Major League Soccer and the USTA and the NFL are all doing great work, uh, and hopefully in the years to come, we will have symposiums celebrating uh, the great work that your leagues are all doing as well. And, uh, and also, just a shout out to my, my family uh, at the Green Sports Lions who uh, put on and ran the uh, Women's Symposium yesterday. That was, that was just a, a wonderful event, really. So, uh, right on, yeah. You know, that, that, that continues to be uh, one of the highlights of the summit year after year, and it's such a creative and smart initiative. Okay, so um, now I have to get into uh, some of my more formal obligations as the president of the Green Sports Alliance. I want to start out by thanking our keynote sponsor, Kimberly Clark, and our title sponsor, UPS, and our presenting sponsor, BASF, uh, and our premier sponsors, OSI Soft, Shift Energy, and ASEAN Corporation. And, and I also remind you all that we have a whole lot of um, business supporters in the exhibit hall that you should all check out. Um, you know, it might sound perfunctory for me to acknowledge the support of these important business organizations being here, and, you know, at some level it is perfunctory, we have to thank them, but really, um, it's, um, you know, it's incredibly, you know, if the sustainable economy doesn't exist, and it doesn't, if you look at the data, uh, it still has to be built, it still has to be uh, invented. 
and it's going to be built and invented largely by the private sector. Uh, so to have um, private sector firms at the, at the level of influence, market influence, cultural influence, uh, it, uh, branding image, uh, supporting this platform of using sports to advance sustainability uh, really has the potential to be uh, transformative, globally transformative. So, uh, you know, thanking them, you know, just keep that in mind that, you know, they're here to support a mission. Uh, and I, I really can't thank, thank them enough for that. Um, for those of you who are um, social media followers, uh, you can follow today's event on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at hashtag green sports. And uh, please, uh, I, I've done it, it's very useful. Um, download the Green Sports Alliance Summit app at the App Store. And um, before I introduce our keynote speaker, our extraordinarily distinguished keynote speaker, Beth Stevens from Disney, uh, I want to introduce a really cool person. Um, actually, a very important person, Charlene Wall Warren is the Director of Sustainability uh, and our, at our presenting sponsor, BASF. And she's gonna come up and say a few words, but let me tell you a few things about Charlene. Uh, she is the Director of Sustainability at BASF in North America, not an insignificant position to hold. Uh, Charlene collaborates with leadership throughout BASF to set environmental strategy and drive sustainable solutions. She combines economic success with environmental protection and social responsibility. Charlene leads a team working throughout BASF, uh, BASF to uh, bring the company's corporate purpose, quote, we create chemistry for a sustainable future, close quote, to life. That's what she does. She advances that idea of advancing a sustainable future at BASF, really important stuff. Uh, by integrating sustainability in business strategies, engaging employees, and collaborating with customers, value chain partners, and other external stakeholders, uh, Charlene's roles over the last 23 years have included project engineering and process design for manufacturing facilities, business and strategy development, marketing, communications, packaging, and life cycle assessment. Uh, her work is touching industries as diverse as petrochemicals, construction, automotive, food, and personal care. So we have a pretty distinguished and smart and cool person uh, coming up. Uh, we spoke about the cool part at breakfast, so I just want to throw that in there. Um, so Charlene, uh, please come on up. Thank you. Good morning. I don't know if I'm gonna live up to the cool part, but I appreciate you saying that, Alan. Um, so in 1992, I was a, a young chemical engineer hailing from the West Coast, graduating after five years of school in West Philadelphia. And if you had asked me at that time, do you ever think in 2015, you'll be talking to an audience representing the sports industry about what a 150-year-old chemical company does to contribute to sustainability? Um, I would have said, no, I, I think you had a few too many, maybe you smoked a little something funny, no, not gonna happen, not gonna happen. But here I am, and, uh, and it's an absolute thrill to be here, and I wanna ask you to think about one thing just in my brief opening remarks. We have something, it's a German saying called der rote Faden, the red thread. So I'm gonna call it a green thread, since we're at the Green Sports Alliance. But it's something I've realized over 20 plus years in my career um, that there is this level of connectivity uh, in everything we do, in every organization. And even at breakfast this morning when I was talking with um, Alan and Beth about animal conservation and some of the great things uh, various organizations are working on, I was struck by this green thread. So who is BISF? In 2011, we launched a new strategy. Alan mentioned we create chemistry for a sustainable future. And it's really about looking forward to the number of people we're gonna have on the planet. The UN estimates 9.6 billion by 2050 with 67% of them living in cities. So one of the key messages I bring through is chemistry is really part of the solution. These people will need food, they'll need housing, they'll need mobility and we want them to have good clean air quality and so forth. And so those are things that technology is really critical in order to help us achieve that. 
This shows you some of the industries that BASF works in, but rather than run through it, I want to highlight a green thread for you. So last week we had 400 chemists and scientists from BASF, about a, about a group probably around this size, uh, here in Chicago for something we called InnoVent. We had a bunch of forums around sustainable food from farm to table, where we had a speaker from the World Wildlife Federation, Unilever, and a farmer come together. So as we were talking about animal conservation this morning, I was sharing last week our 400 chemists and engineers had the opportunity to hear from, in this case, Jason Clay from the World Wildlife Federation about the number of species that are becoming extinct around the world. Not every chemical company does that as part of their innovation forum. So it was a beautiful red, red slash green thread running through it. And as you can see, we're active in many, many of these industries. So there's a lot we can do um, being at the front of all these value chains. Another green thread is green sense. So One World Trade Center in New York City um, uses our green sense technology. It's not just a molecule that goes into the concrete. It's actually a solution where we work with our business partners and concrete formulators to quantify energy, water, and waste savings from this technology. I have a husband who works in uh, the construction industry in New York City, and so it's a particular pride point to know that technology is in those buildings. And when I chatted with Beth this morning, we were chatting about some of the technologies that BISF offers into Disney for waterproofing, energy efficiency, and durability. Oh, and by the way, red slash green thread, we're also both focusing on biodiversity and conservationism. And the last red slash green thread is in the area of baseball. So about five years ago, um, I went out to my home state of Washington and we visited Safeco Field. Scott Jenkins was out there at the time and I went with our group that does the certified compostable plastics. We learned about what they wanted to accomplish in the stadium. We thought this was a really interesting space for us, also looking for good and relevant markets for um, compostable plastics being used in the best and most appropriate way. And we partnered with them as they achieved over 90% landfill diversion, which is how we landed here today. And now we're partnering, coming back to the red-green thread of New York City, we're partnering with Doug Behar and the New York Yankees. And it's a great honor as a 150-year-old chemical company to partner with such a historic team and venue as Yankee Stadium. So the last thought I would leave you with is do look for these red slash green threads. BISF does a lot of scientific collaborations around the world. We focus on specific topics from water to biodiversity to sustainability in general. This is our first time really being in the sports world together with you and none of it can be achieved without teamwork. So I encourage you guys, look for that red thread, that green thread, help us weave it through everything we do, whether it's this conference, a game that you might be hosting at your venue, a visit to Disney, or a visit to BASF. And I wish you all a wonderful day and looking forward to hearing from Beth. Thanks, Charlene. Thanks for your great work, really. Um, now, I, this is really, uh, truly a, a, a great personal pleasure uh, for me to introduce our opening keynote speaker, Dr. Beth Stevens. I have had the privilege of knowing and working with Beth uh, since almost when she joined Disney almost 20 years ago. Uh, she has a PhD in biology with a specialization in animal behavior. Uh, as the senior vice president of corporate citizenship environment and conservation <coughs> at Disney. Um, Beth is responsible for developing and enabling the implementation of the company's environment and conservation programs. This includes the work to minimize the company's footprint, conserve nature for future generations, and help kids develop lifelong conservation values through nature exploration. Beth joined Disney almost 20 years ago 19 years ago, to help open Disney's Animal Kingdom theme park, and her first role was as conservation and science director, and then ultimately she was promoted to vice president of Disney's Animal Kingdom theme park and Disney's animal programs division. She helped invent Disney's conservation fund and education program, and um, as we know, um, Disney, uh, one of the most culturally 
influential, market influential, mainstream uh, entertainment firms in the world, almost in a, almost in a platform of its own. Uh, and to have Disney here today to uh, endorse our mission, our organization, the work that you're all doing um, is in incredibly important. Um, Beth is one of the most influential sustainability professionals in the business world, which, which of course makes her one of the most influential sustainability advocates in the world at large. Um, and um, she is also a very cool person. So uh, with no further ado, I'm gonna um, turn it over to Beth Stevens. You've probably heard people talk about conservation. Well, conservation isn't just the business of a few people. It's a matter that concerns all of us. It's a science whose principles are written in the oldest code in the world, the laws of nature. The natural resources of our vast continent are not inexhaustible. But if we will use our riches wisely, if we will protect our wildlife, and preserve our lakes and streams, These things will last us for generations to come. At Disney, our commitment to conservation and the environment is a legacy that we're proud of. We provide animal care, conduct research, educate, lead support and fund numerous conservation efforts worldwide. Together, we can preserve our planet, the creatures who share it with us, and continue our legacy of conservation and change. Thank you all so much, and uh, I really want to thank Alan for that great introduction. I just said to him, I think I'm going to ask him to come introduce me whenever I speak. Thank you, Alan. And really thank you to the Green Sports Alliance for having me here today. Uh, I'm Dr. Beth Stevens, and I help lead Disney's environment and conservation efforts. And as you just saw from Walt himself, his um, caring about the planet has really always been a part of our DNA at Disney. And so it's especially fun for me to be here today talking to an audience who really shares that sense of caring for the planet uh, and shares the same values that we have. Because, you know, actually, Disney and the Green Sports Alliance have a lot in common. So whether it's the theme parks or stadiums, we're both filling really large venues. We both have big audiences and very diverse fan bases. And since we're both in the sports business, we each have an incredible opportunity to harness the power of our own actions to inspire our fans. So it's, it's a journey that we're on together, and it is a long one. So for me, it's exciting to have this opportunity to really share with you some of the steps that we've taken and it's my great hope that maybe some of these things will resonate with you and that you all may um, hear something that applies to your own environmental journey. Well, at Disney, our concern for kids and families extends beyond their entertainment to the world in which they live. And this means that we believe very strongly that our actions as a company have to live up to the same standard that's set by the stories we tell and the characters we create. And it means that we really have a responsibility to help bring about that better future that we help people imagine. And so Disney citizenship grew out of this belief. I'm, I'm a part of the Disney citizenship team. 
And we're a group of passionate people, just like I think this whole room is filled with a group of very passionate people. And we're dedicated to carrying out this Disney's commitment to act responsibly and to inspire positive action in the millions of kids and families we reach every day. Well, through Disney citizenship, there's kind of four main ways that we do this. It's through a focus on living healthier, strengthening communities, thinking creatively, and conserving nature, which is my specialty. Well, as you, as you heard from Walt and saw in the video, conservation is really hardly a new effort for Disney. It's, uh, our company's focus on the stewardship of our planet really began with Walt, and he said, and you, you heard a little bit, uh, you missed a little bit of it in the beginning of the video, but I love these words where he said, conservation isn't just the business of a few people, it's a matter that concerns us all. And so from the very beginning, we at Disney have always believed that because our resources are finite, we have to make a very conscious effort to use them wisely in everything we do and how we do it. Well, we're Disney, so of course, we have to have a name for this idea. And it's a mindset that we call environmentality. Very Disney sounding, isn't it? And this is uh, our sort of worldview of thinking and acting with the environment in mind. And this is infused throughout every part of our company today. Environmentality, it describes a process in which we first focus on our own impacts and our own footprint. So we lead by example. And then we use our strength as storytellers to inspire others through our sustainability efforts. So that means engaging our employees, our guests, our consumers, our viewers, and of course our fans along each and every step. Now if you look closely, you can see environmentality everywhere at Disney, from the characters and settings of our films to our parks and wildlife. It's the majesty of nature that's always been part of this inspiration for the worlds we create. And so that's why we feel it's our responsibility to conserve this beauty for future generations, both by using our resources wisely to protect the planet as we operate our businesses, and by encouraging and inspiring others to do the same. Now, I'm sure that everyone here can appreciate the layers of time and effort that go into this work. Like all of you, you can't simply, at least we can't, simply issue a memo to make environmentality happen. Do environmentality, doesn't happen that way. It takes a lot of planning and groundwork and socializing and even at breakfast this morning, Charlene and I were saying, you know, sometimes we're just hitting our heads against the wall. It takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. And, and like I said, it, it's, it's a journey. So since acting as a responsible environmental steward is an integral part of our brand, we had to figure out how to make it a core part of our business as well. So that all of our thousands of daily operating decisions fully reflected our commitment to environmentality. So how do we do that? Well, frankly, we weren't quite sure at first. So we started out by asking ourselves some very specific questions about how we wanted to make a difference. And we set some really ambitious targets and goals. And we made sure that every part of our company began marching in a common direction. Took time. And we got smarter about tracking our progress. Now, I'll never forget this moment. So when we announced some of these big, bold objectives, like zero net emissions and zero waste, our CEO, Bob Iger looked at me as he was getting ready to make this announcement, and he asked me two really important questions. First, can we really achieve these? And second, and exactly how are we going to achieve these? Well, to the first question, I answered yes, without any hesitation. Of course we can achieve these. To the second question, well, with a lot of hesitation, I kind of said, well, I don't know how. Okay, this possibly career-ending response <laughs> was actually an important moment because we recognize that if we wanted to spur innovation and develop some really creative solutions to minimizing our impact, 
we would have to set our bar really high. And so that's exactly what we did. And then we settled in for a long journey and knew that we would figure it out along the way. So one of the first steps that we took back in 2009, makes it sound like it's so long ago, um, when we adopted and began reporting on our first set of environmental targets, all of which we either met or exceeded five years later. So we started out not knowing if we could do it, and we, we exceeded our expectations. So, so far, we've reduced our net direct greenhouse gas emissions by half, decreased our electricity consumption by more than 10%, and we think we can eventually get to zero net emissions. Now, there certainly isn't an obvious silver bullet. In fact, sometimes I call it silver buckshot. There is not a, an obvious silver bullet for any company to just suddenly become greener, much less one as big and diverse as Disney, where the environmental challenges facing theme parks are dramatically different than those facing the movie studio or consumer products or ESPN. But at least when it comes to reducing emissions, we realize that the best solutions come from motivating, innovative problem solving within each of these unique businesses. And so that's exactly what we had in mind when we set an internal price on carbon. Disney's one of the few companies to do this. We actually charge our business units for their own emissions. So this compels each business to build its projected emi carbon emissions into their bottom line, and it incentivizes them, more importantly, to find scalable solutions that keep their carbon footprint as small as possible. So the less they emit, the less they're charged. Well, that environmentality encouraged every vi in division to explore various ways to improve their own energy efficiency, which we know is actually one of the easiest ways to significantly impact emissions. So at the Magic Kingdom, as you see our wonderful um, Cinderella's castle here outfitted for the holidays with icicles, they decided that they would outfit the castle with more than 170,000 LED lights. Okay, these use the equivalent of only four coffee pots. Throughout Walt Disney World, we're using alternative fuels, for instance, wherever possible. So cleaner fuels like propane and com compressed natural gas now powers many of our rides and attractions. And we recently transformed the buses that carry our guests into one of the country's first entire fleets to run on R50, a renewable diesel made from substances like used cooking oil from our restaurants. So as a result of these decisions, the resort is cutting its bus fleet carbon emissions by almost 50%. Okay, but even after you do these great energy efficiency plays and alternative fuels and you do all of this, you're still gonna have emissions. And so we use the funds from the internal carbon charges to invest in high quality forest carbon offsets through something we call the Disney Climate Solutions Fund. So in just the last five years, these offset investments have added up to over $56 million in forest conservation, improved forest management, and reforestation projects around the world. Because you see, forests are like the lungs of the earth. They absorb carbon dioxide and they produce oxygen. Fantastic. So we chose to invest in forests, not only for their carbon benefits, but also for their nature conservation and community benefits to conserve their natural beauty for future generations. So using this type of approach ensures that our businesses continue to grow in a responsible way, while we're also helping to build a brighter future for all of us. All right, now, reducing our energy use and emissions has helped us to make a lot of progress, but it's only one part of the journey. We operate some of the largest venues and properties in the world, so water use and waste management are also a really important part of this sustainability portfolio. So a few years back, we adopted water conservation plans at all of our parks and resorts. And one qu question we asked ourselves is, how, as a large company, how do you deal with challenges related to water because those challenges are all very localized. Like everything else, as I said, there is no silver bullet here. <coughs> there is no silver bullet. So many of the solutions have to be tailored to, to the specific sites. Doesn't mean we can't implement guidelines, 
but what we did was we made sure that each of our sites was aware of current best practices and we helped them identify specific ways they can conserve water on their own, like at Disneyland Resort. They installed an on-site weather station to monitor atmospheric conditions, which then helps them to adjust their irrigation accordingly so that we don't waste water. At the ESPN Data Center, they're saving tens of thousands of gallons of municipal water every single day, thanks to an innovative groundwater collection system. This is much more than the system requires, so the excess is actually stored in a retention pond that supports local wildlife. Well, much like our goal of zero net greenhouse gas emissions, we also hope to attain a zero state when it comes to the significant waste our company generates even as we continue to expand in different markets around the world. So by 2020, we're hoping that we can achieve 60% of waste diverted from landfills and incineration. Well, Walt Disney World found one really creative solution by becoming the first customer of this beautiful local facility you see here that actually converts more than 120,000 tons of organic waste annually into renewable biogas and natural fertilizers while producing 5.4 megawatts of combined heat and power. And the environmentality spread from there when ESPN's Wide World of Sports facility in Orlando decided to follow Walt Disney World's lead and now they make huge efforts to reduce their energy use as well. They do, sometimes it takes, it's the simplest things like dimming your field lights while you're in long periods of maintenance. But ESPN is doing so much more. They're partnering with colleges and sponsors to increase recycling and reduce waste during all college game day broadcasts. And in all of their new construction and renovations, they're not only pursuing LEED certification, but they're also installing technology like solar panels and motion sensors to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So following this playbook is how ESPN has already significantly cut the amount of waste that is sent to landfills and reduced the amount by as much as 90% at major events like the X Games. So at the recent X Games, just at the beginning of this month in Austin, they were able to divert 25,000 pounds of waste into compost. And in Aspen, the X Games team actually dug through every single bag of trash themselves, sorting out what could be recycled. As you can imagine, well, that's a scene <laughs> that makes a real impression on our fans. And we hope it also inspires them to take initiative on their own. It certainly rubbed off on our passionate ESPYs green team, whose waste diversion has been holding steady at 85% for the last three years. So, in fact, in, in 2014, at the party, at the ESPYs post party, which had 3,000 guests, okay, there were only six bags of trash created. So let me just show you a brief um, video that'll give you a little peek at our team at the ESPYs in action. I'm Nora Ali, backstage at ESPY's Environmentality to learn about all the cool things ESPN is doing to make the ESPY's greener than ever. Environmentality is our environmental mentality, our mission to execute productions of very little energy use and waste. Not just here at ESPY's and its associated parties, ESPY's golf tournament and partner hotels, but at all ESPN owned events. Here at the Nokia Theater, we have a green team to help us separate all our waste into five categories. Paper, cardboard, commingled recycling, construction debris, and food for composting. Not only do we compost all our food scraps, but we also serve our food to the crew on products made from only sugarcane fiber. All napkins are 100% recycled and unbleached. Every year we reach approximately 90% diversion from the landfill. We have more than 35 water refill stations and provide reusable water bottles to all the staff and media. They can also use compostable cups made from corn plastic that will break down in 60 days at a compost facility. Our staff can bring in old t-shirts from home to have the ESPY's environmentality logo screen printed on them to make them a new shirt again. Outside, the red carpet is made from 50,000 recycled plastic water bottles, and then the entire red carpet is recycled after use. Looking up, the DJ's turntables and speakers are powered by photovoltaic cells, or commonly known as solar panels. At ESPY Golf, we partner with our food vendors to serve on only compostable products, and we collect all the compost and recyclables from the locations we set up all over the course using our solar-powered golf carts. When they leave the show and head to one of our parties, SB guests will find selections of local and organic food as well as recycling, composting, and water hydration stations. A staff member is always on hand to make sure it's easy to be green. 
Guest key cards for the hotel rooms are wooden, made from sustainably managed birch instead of plastic. Many of our staff and VIPs travel in hybrid and flex fuel cars. Some even ride their bikes. Every year we strive to surpass our efforts of the previous year. While the work is never done, we can be proud of what we accomplished and hope that we inspire other productions to do the same and even you at home. Reporting for ESPN Sustainability Team, I'm Nora Ali. So. Thank you, they do a great job. And, and you know, all of these actions and just examples that I have just shared with you, okay, this is the first step. And, but we know really that the only way that we're gonna ultimately reach our destination on this journey is in, to inspire others to do their part as well. And so from our earliest movies and characters and nature movies, Disney's has, has really worked to instill some conservation values in our employees and guests and kids and families around the world. And our Disney nature movies are a great example of this. Most people will probably go their whole lives without encountering a real bear cl up close, which is probably a good thing. But we've seen how our films can bring the wonder of nature right into people's homes. And of course, we have beloved characters that can inspire kids to care, uh, to start caring at a very early age. If, you, if you've seen the energy efficiency ads the Department of Energy's put out, you've probably noticed their lead spokes fairy is Tinkerbell. Now, I know that not everyone has a vast roster of imaginary magical sidekicks you can call on, but everyone here at the Green Sports Alliance, what everyone here has is just as powerful. First, you have mascots. In fact, I've learned from Alan that a disproportionate amount of these are animals. And with your Mascots Forever conservation program, you're taking images that are iconic to fans and using them to personalize the plight of real life species. And second, you have some of the best athletes on the planet who can serve as the greatest role models for kids that anyone could ever ask for. You can tap into their power to inspire fans of all ages to start taking their own actions that can add up to an enormous environmental impact. Well, we've seen this phenomenon at work in our own operations. When our employees and cast members understand that their own actions matter, then they come up with all kinds of ideas and to help Disney meet its environmental stewardship and nature conservation goals. So at Epcot here, even our custodial team is part of this effort. So as kids and families are waiting near certain attractions, they engage kids by giving them special pickers. Okay, free tip here. Kids love pickers and they show them how to sort different types of recycling. One of my favorite stories from the past year shows how you can actually observe the change in behavior we've instilled in people over time. At ESPN, we work with a lot of TV production crews, and as you can imagine, they can generate a lot of waste, and the fact that they're always on the move, that presents an added challenge. Recently, one crew that spent a lot of time working alongside ESPN found themselves in a location that only had trash bins. Can you imagine that? Without any hesitation, the crew found and put out their own recycling bins alongside the trash. They even drew signs with Sharpies and cardboard telling people that about half the trash should have been re recycled instead. Well, because they checked. And this was a scene that unfolded organically in front of hundreds of our fans and created a story they'll remember along with a lesson that they're not likely to forget. And it may be just one moment in time, but it, it proves that many of the colleagues, fans, and even total strangers we inspire are all taking our mission as seriously as we do. So I hope this peek into our own process has provided you with maybe some ideas as you continue to enhance sustainability efforts in your own organizations. We know that each organization, each company is unique and requires its own approaches and solutions. But I think that by simply setting goals and targets and not being afraid to adapt and change course along the journey, any company can make themselves greener. Just make your goals accessible to your employees and fans who have a role to play and a desire to help you achieve success. So if we work together and tell stories that engage and inspire our consumers and fans and motivate them to start making a difference in their own communities, then really nothing is out of our reach. 
You know, Walt famously remarked that Disneyland would never be finished as long as there's imagination left in the world. Well, we view our approach to sustainability in the same way. Even though our environmentality work will never be done and the journey will never be over, we should always continue inspiring each other to do more. And so I hope that you'll keep helping us find new pathways to that inspiration. So thank you very much. Thank you.